So um, as you can see on my your screen, you should have uh, the slide just changed. This is first robotics manipulators. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm the head coach of Team 3023. My first year in robotics was 2009. No, 2010 was the first season breakaway. Um, our team is Stark Industries. I can't take credit for naming that, but we love it. Iron Man's our mascot. It's a lot of fun. This presentation will cover kickers, catapults, winches, power um, in general, and motors, because these are all the reason why the kickers and the catapults are here and not in the first presentation is just simply that they are, they tend to be a lot more high power and those go together with lifting mechanisms. So first question, if you've been to one of these before, you know this question, what is the definition most teams use for a manipulator? If you could please type in the chat, the words that your students use, the words that you have used in the past, what do you call these things? Um, we're looking for hilarious, comical answers only, none of the actual technical ones. And then we'll move on and talk about the actual definition. The movie thingy, very good, yes. It's always a classic. The grabby arm, yes. Um, I do like, I, I feel like it has to have thingy in there somewhere. So it's usually grabby army thing. That's always a good one. That thingy, that's good, yes. We do a lot of like, you know, the up down thing. You know, the thing that goes like, I mean, it's a lot of hand gestures. It's a lot of hand gestures going on here. Um, arm thing, good, yes. So keep them coming if you want. I'll try to read them off. Uh, it's a device that moves a game piece from where it is to where you want it to be. And in this one, I would recommend that Try to give it a name, try to give it a fun name uh, as early as possible, just to prevent people from just talking about, and also you usually have like three or four things that do the thing. So it's best to try to specify sooner rather than later. Um, this one, manipulate what? It's important to first ask this question. And this is where I'm talking about, we're gonna go with field elements here. And these are all games where we've had situations where we had to manipulate uh, something other than just a game piece. A lot of these games, it'll show you just game piece only, especially early on. So I had to find these old pictures of some old games I'd never even really seen before. They're pretty cool. Um, game piece only, game piece only, all of these. And then here's what we start to see. Um, um, Mark, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. It's getting no, harder to hear you. Uh, okay. Let me try, um, let me give me a sec, I'll grab my Bluetooth headphones and we will hope that that will improve the sound. Give me a little bit here. Okay, let me. I feel like there should be like on hold music or something here. Let me. Okay. Yeah, we can't hear anything, if you can hear us. <laughs> Thank you, Luke, for the comment. Definitely not better. Okay. 
Okay. I'll try to connect it up. Is it? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. All right. Is it still a little glitchy? Um. Yeah. Uh, no, I think I can hear you now. I did. Does okay. anyone else have feedback? It sounds okay to me. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. I will keep my face right up in the camera so that my mouth is over the microphone and you just get a real <laughs> nice look up my nose every once in a while. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, you got to love the uh, HVAC in, in the school system. Okay. So, all right. Uh, I'll try to keep the volume up and I'll try to enunciate. Uh, what you see up on screen, this is 2001. This is a balance beam that if you were in first uh, quite a while ago, this is exactly like what we had in Rebound Rumble, which you'll see coming up in a little bit. 2000, that was the first time we had to do a bar hang. Now you'll see a, a couple more with in piece only uh, games. Here's another bar hang and watch for these because you're gonna be asked to see if you can remember how many times we did all of the things. Okay, here, this 2007, that's rock and roll, that's a robot lift. Um, that's the one we were talking about before. In Peace Only, 2010, Breakaway, Bar Hang. Um, 2011, we had to deploy a mini bot. Here's Rebound Rumble, there you see the uh, balance bridge again. And now we have pyramids that we had to climb, In Peace Only. Oh, okay, so uh, if you were around for a Stronghold, it was all uh, field elements that we had to interact with. The game piece in that game was almost like a an afterthought, to be honest. Um, here we go, 2018, we had a hang the robot. Uh, we had a lift, and of course, 2020 infinite recharge. If you're going to be at the mini mini regional, um, you'll be hanging one last time. So here's the question for you. Please vote using the stamps. If you don't know the stamps, there should be at the top of your screen, the annotation. How many times did bar hang show up? Please put a stamp next to the correct number. All right. Levi says four, and five. This is always fun too. I don't remember the correct answer. It's on the next slide, so. Uh, Seven, seven's high. Okay, yeah, I do remember what it is now. Okay, five, all right. Somebody drew a rock. Hi, Luke, how's it going? Figured out how to type in the annotation, good job. All right, so um, the correct answer is six. Wait, two, four, okay, good. Two, four, six. Okay, good, my brain did a little, okay. Uh, we've had to do a bar hang six times, and we've had to do a climb seven or twice. Now, this is where it's a little tricky, because what do you call a climb? Um, in Steamworks, we had to climb straight up a rope. In Ultimate Ascent, we had to climb up the pyramid with the bars. Some argue Ultimate Ascent is a bar climb. Yeah, if that's you, don't worry. There's no money riding on this, so... Um, reoccurring themes. We had balance bridge twice. We also had lift a robot or lift your robot or some sort of thing like that. That happened three times. All right. So um, today, what are we going to be talking about? Kickers, catapults, climbing, winches, power in general, and also motors and decisions. Okay. Kickers and catapults. Kickers and catapults. The things we want to talk about is. This, this is why these are included with the winches and the power calculations and the motor calculations. It's a sudden release of power. Usually we have stored power going on, um, some sort of stored energy. This one right here, you have a, um, a catapult system. This one is gonna be, this is a pneumatic one, and I think I have, here we go, Thor's hammer. Um, that one is, I believe, Mechtronic from Alexandria. All of these are talking about lots and lots of power being released very, very quickly by some mechanism. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. Some are more dangerous than others. Some are more reliable than others. But regardless, these are some general rules that you need to think about whenever you're designing a kicker or a catapult. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you test it uh, for safety and security. And the other problem is having this is the problem. 
you want a very quick, fast release, but you also want it to be extremely secure and strong previous to the fast release. And that can be, those two can fight with each other. So it says design and test a good latch mechanism. That's exactly what you want to be doing. And we want a There we go. Let's see if I can this. Okay. Okay. So, kind of points. Um, make sure that you have enough power and enough stopping power. That can be difficult as well. A lot of times, teams don't necessarily think about the stopping power, and then they end up lifting their bot or actually flipping their bot right over. Uh, the other thing is test the frame. There was a team that did a robot in three days many years ago, and they actually just warped and bent their frame with their catapults. So these are things you have to be careful with. Um, reloading a catapult. This is another one where you have to be careful of how you do it. Basically, most teams use a mechanism like this. This is called the choo-choo. And what it does is it catches part of this lever and pulls it down. And once it gets all the way around, it releases. This is really nice because a lot of us are using um, motors with circular motion, but catapults, it is a linear motion and it can be difficult to translate one into the other. The other major way that people like to do this, this is called the cam gear. And this is one from Breakaway 2010. This is the Robo Wranglers Team 178. Or is it 148? Oh no, now my brain's trying to remember, okay. Um, this is the armadillo, I fell in love with this robot. It's pretty impressive, you'll actually see it later on doing a bar hang. But they do a really, really good job of using this cam gear to reset their kicker. So they just have a bungee powered catapult kicker and it reloads very, very uh, quickly and easily with this, with this cam gear. Okay, so what I like now is this, um, true or false, the cam gear is better than the choo-choo mechanism. So what I want you to do is, if you think, yes, that's true, uh, click on the green check mark, and we'll see it up in our, in our faces. And then if you're like, no, that's ridiculous. Why would you say such a horrible, stupid thing? Go with the red X. And please post your reasoning in the comments or in the chat section so we can see why you think what you think is true. I am looking. Okay, thanks for you. More control. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, Luke said the cam gear is faster and simpler. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. We built both. Um, the, yeah. Yeah, you can tell my bias by the way I phrased the question. The, the issue with the choo-choo mechanism is you are only able to support that mechanism on one side. And that is it's generally just something we, we on 3023, we try to avoid. We try to always support. Anytime we have a shaft, we want it supported on both sides. There are a lot of forces going on when it's trying to pull down. And the forces are not... Um, consistent. The forces change as it does the pulling mechanism. And so there's just a lot of room for error. There's a lot of ways for the choo-choo mechanism to just rip itself apart. You're talking about high forces. So I would recommend the cam. It usually uh, provides you with a lot more stability and strength. And seems like the cam, Mark Lawrence says, seems like the cam has less stress on the components. Totally true. Uh, very accurate. The the cam, the choo-choo does have its benefits, and there are, there are some situations where you, the cam just won't do. Um, usually, you can make it work that way if you want to, though. All right, let's see what we got next. I mean, okay, this is always fun. There's, there's nothing so exciting as watching a whole bunch of robots lift up off the ground, and nothing so terrifying as watching one fall. Uh, if you've ever been in the pits and you just hear the crowd go, ooh, and then there's just Oh my gosh, you know a robot fell. Um, I've seen some very scary ones. In fact, there's going to be a couple coming up that we're going to talk about. So as far as climbing goes, there's two basic methods. There's pneumatics and a winch. 
Uh, there are other ones you can always make up, but really that's that's really what's going down here. You can do it with a chain drive, but essentially it's a winch by another name. We're gonna talk about pneumatics first. Um, I love this picture because it's really this picture right here. I love the look on the kid's face uh, because you know this is a photo from the first time they tested this thing. Also, look at the length on those pistons. This thing is insane. And this year, if you haven't seen any stuff from this year, uh, we were only allowed to touch two bars at a time. So you had to be, you couldn't like spend three of the bars on the pyramid. This made it very, very difficult. Um, and you had to go for a crazy distance like you see up on screen. So pneumatics, they can be very powerful um, and they're, they can be really good because my favorite thing about pneumatics is they store energy in a non-electrical way which a lot of times, if you're gonna to have to climb, you're doing it at the end game. And that's when you want to have uh, some energy left over. It can be difficult to budget. I mean, if you drive your robot hard, you might not have enough juice left in your battery or more likely if somebody forgot to pop in a fresh battery before you went out for your competition, you might not have what you need for end game. And pneumatics can nicely and easily uh, prevent that problem. Okay, so um, pneumatics are pretty straightforward. You just have to make sure you have a long enough reach. Uh, winch is a little bit different story. When you're talking about a winch, it's really about power and control. It's almost always about control, no matter what we're doing with it's uh, bringing in game pieces or scoring or anything like that. And this is where it gets a little dicey and you see there's a lot of different ways to do it. When we do winches, you wanna have a brake system. You need a latch mechanism. Uh, and that's why this can get a bit more complicated. So uh, what are the options here? Winches are really good for high torque applications. Uh, they can go really tiny and that is just wonderful. Another thing that we're not gonna talk a ton about is a mechanism by which to get your cable or whatever you have. A lot of teams will have like, if the game has an elevator system or a lift system that they're using for their game piece, that's something they'll have going up and down. And then that is what they will use to get their winch mechanism or their cable up there. We'll talk about some teams will use the same motors for both. And we'll talk about the issues with that in a little bit. Um, this here, what you see, these are both metal cable winches. And the benefits of that, it's very nice and small and, and it works pretty well. The issues is sometimes you can get binding with those if you're not careful, if you don't have the right type of metal cabling. So uh, the other thing obviously is good for pulling and lifting. You'll see a lot of cool stuff here. Uh, winches, okay. Hanging and climbing. This one is a scissor lift. It's amazing. Um, if I remember correctly, I looked into this one. This is where the scissor lift is just there to get the, the, the cable up to the bar hook. So the scissor lift got it there and then they had a powerful winch to bring it back down. Uh, what you see over on the right though from team 2056, it's a pretty impressive um, grab a robot and reach for the sky. So, winch design, general guidelines, some ideas. Uh, you need to secure it. This is gonna be somewhat similar to some of the advice that was in my last presentation about uh, lifts and elevators. You need to make sure that the cable routing is smooth, both for the winding and the unwinding. It's also very critical that you have control at all times. Having a winch system where it just pulls straight down, it can be, it can be problematic, it can cause some issues. Um, it is still doable though. Oh, here's another one. Um, leave room on the drum for extra cable. This is something we don't always think about. The other thing, we generally use a lot of uh, strap instead of cabling just because the strap is nice because it will, it doesn't bind, it doesn't cinch, it doesn't. It also doesn't like try to attack your fingers when you're dealing with it. And metal cable hates human skin. It just tries to attack it a chance it can. The thing you do have to remember though is what it says up on screen. If you're using strap, as the strap winds around the drum, the diameter of the drum increases and this changes how much strap you're pulling in. And so if you don't take that into consideration, it can cause some problems. 
I'm trying to make guides for the cable, uh, put it through some tubing, put it through anything that you need. Just have, I mean, this can be also as simple as just like a tensioner, like a pulley, just to provide a little force uh, there for the cable. Yeah, so just make sure you always got tension on that thing. But winch design, you want cabling in both directions. Both the torque and the speed, there'll be a little bit more on that coming when we talk about power and what that means and how to calculate it and how to make decisions about that. Um, gravity return is not recommended. If you've been with me for any of my previous presentations, you'll know that gravity is tempting because it's always there, but it is not as reliable as you think. Um, <laughs> there is no, except for after the match, yes. Once the match is done, then yes, uh, gravity. When you're building a winch mechanism for a lifting of your robot, you need to have some sort of braking device. Uh, you never want to use your motors to hold the weight of your robot. You will then have a robot that will start, the, the magic smoke will come out of the robot and you don't want that to happen. Uh, it is very, very bad. Your motors will blow out. So the other thing that people don't always necessarily take into consideration is having a spring or a bungee for the return, having a mechanism that will provide mechanical assistance. Uh, we were just working on a robot for Saturday's Mini Mini, and one of the kids is like, there's no way that motor can do what we need it to do. And I'm like, right, but that's what the bungees are for. And they were very skeptical until they saw it work, which is, you know, kind of always how it goes. So after all that, time to vote. If you think pneumatics are the way to go for lifting your robot, please go with the, uh, the green check mark. And if you're like winches all the way, the red X. And again, please, if you could uh, provide your reasoning in the chat. We have a comment in the chat. Winches are cool. I think they are too. I like winches. They're really good for uh, the tight spaces, which is really nice if you need a really low robot to get under stuff. Pneumatics can be awesome though. We've done both. Yeah. My only issue with pneumatics, and I know you can do this with some of the magnetic ones, is um, it's, it's hard to get the right distances. It's hard to control. You know, it's like, it's it's yes or no it's up or down i do know that they do have the magnetic ones that allow you to have stops in there but i mean it's sometimes where if the longest piston you have is 30 inches and you need 35 it's really difficult to uh, work with that that's all but i would say this um pneumatics definitely win for simplicity uh there is a lot going for that there's a lot to say for that all right so we're gonna move right along. If you wanna say anything else uh, about winches or pneumatics, please feel free. Now I wanna to talk to you about preventing back driving. And what you'll see here is a ratchet device. You need some sort of ratchet device to allow one way motion, but not the other motion. And this, this can be difficult as well. And we'll talk about this. This team has decided just to put a half inch ratchet on their robot. and. We've done that. I see no problem with it. There is, I'm pretty sure it's on Vex website. They're like ratchets uh, belong in your toolbox, not on your robot. And I'm like, okay, yeah, but at the same time, if it works, it works. And this can be just a nice way, um, especially if a lot of times you have a ratchet on there to prevent your robot from, from falling, from dropping. And then they cut power to your bot. A ratchet device like this, you need to be able to release it very simply so that you can get your robot down or off or anything like that. You just need to think through things like that. Uh, so clutch bearing, clutch bearing will completely lock one direction for you. And there are a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, this one's, what you can see here is, this is actually just like a ratchet strap system that they stole and repurposed for the robot. It's totally doable. Um, I've never seen this, but I kind of think it'd be really cool. The reason why I think it'd be awesome to see a seatbelt mechanism on a robot is mostly because the seatbelts use inertia to trigger them because we all know that like the seatbelt will lock. And so uh, this would be a system where 
And I've talked with teams, I think somebody used this at one point, you'd have some sort of a lever so that like, it only becomes a ratchet once the robot has left the ground. Because a lot of times if you have an elevator that's going up and down, you want it to be able to go up and down. You don't want one way directional motion. You need it to only be a ratchet during end game. And so this would be a way to somewhat simply have a system where it turns into a ratchet only at one point. Uh, this is actually a mechanism. This is a picture off of our robot from this year. This is something Acute came up with because um, our lifting mechanism for the hanging bar, it needs to go up and down and up and down and up and down. And in this situation, um, it's connected to just a very simple VEX 393, like a servo motor, and it will click into place and then lock. And that's, it works pretty well and uh, stops the robot from falling and it prevents the motors from having to hold the robot. This is a bike bike. Um, and while I do not recommend this, I still think, honestly, this falls into the category. If it works, who am I to say not to do it? Honestly, if you find anything that works, go for it. At the same time, this feels like probably not the best way to go about putting some brakes on the robot. Um, something you should know, though, is any gearbox that cannot be back driven is probably very inefficient. We'll talk about this more with the motors, but like some of the window motors, the Bosch seat motor, these are not back drivable. And that's true because they have a worm gear inside and that makes them less efficient. Okay. Here's another thing to think about when you're, when you're building some sort of a hook or a winch or a climbing mechanism, it is very wise to have a latch. And sometimes it's completely unnecessary. A lot of teams will just hook their um, grabbing device, which works really well sometimes. Until it doesn't though, that's, and that's the problem because sometimes if your robot's swinging a little bit, it'll just fall right off and it is terrifying and heart stopping to watch a bot nearly fall. I mean, it's great as long as it doesn't, but still. And the other problem is latches. I mean, what you see here on the picture at the top, that is a homemade latch system that a robotics team built. The one on the bottom that is ripped out of a car door. That is what car doors use to latch in lock. So uh, once we used a bicycle disc brake with a pneumatic actuator, did, I'm assuming it worked, yeah? Yeah. Honestly, there are some people who will like, like Vex throw shade about having a wrench on your robot, but I, if it works, do it. I don't see why. I don't see why not to do anything, go for it. So if you can take something that's off the shelf, why not? Um, <clears throat> This is something I added after we had our ramp debacle. Start your, your latch design early because it tends to be an afterthought. It was for us, and I would recommend not doing that. Okay. Uh, this is a pretty impressive latch mechanism for a climbing rope. It is 148. Okay. This is the Robo Wranglers. This is that same robot from earlier. And what you don't necessarily see in this, in this GIF file is they wrote their number on the bottom of the robot. And what they would do for this game is they would actually lift their bot and show their bottom to the other team. And it's as close to a robot mooning people as I've ever seen. And it was very impressive. This is just one of the most crazy ways I've ever seen a team decide to lift their robot. So it's just impressive. And the latch makes it all that much more necessary. Okay, now we're gonna transfer to power. Please answer in the chat with the best answer you've ever heard from a student about this question. Like, what does power mean? The force. That's good. That one is actually good. I have, I have a baby Yoda photo coming up later on about the force, which is good. I just feel a little bit bad for students who are watching. They're like, ah, oh, yeah. Sometimes they equate it to speed. Yes. Okay. So these are things, yeah. Faster. That makes, it's wrong, but it's logical. And then someone says, bigger. And then I make this face. And they say like, more? Just more. It's always like, 
Okay, okay, okay. And this is where my students um, get a, a brief and quick lesson. So here's a question. What does power really mean? Which of the following is correct for what does power really mean? Please vote for the stamp next to the equation that you think is the best answer for what is power. Those of you who've had physics before, hopefully you see the trick in the question. Force times volume, okay. Okay, so we got some comments, good. Got some people voting. The, the trick is all of those are correct. Now, the question is, which one is the most useful for FIRST Robotics? Again, it's difficult because if you look on screen, um, power is energy over time, but energy can be expressed both as electrical energy, current times voltage, or mechanical energy, work divided by time. I'm gonna walk through very quickly here how you get from work over time to force times velocity. So work is force times distance. So power equals force times distance divided by time. Okay, and velocity is distance divided by time. Therefore, power equals force times velocity. And this may seem trivial to those of you who are engineers or physics majors, and it totally is, but to the average freshman, power doesn't necessarily mean this. And also I know a lot of adults that don't necessarily quite grasp this either. So the thing you have to realize is Power, because it's, it's force times velocity, you must choose. You cannot have both force and speed. It is not an option. You have to have one or the other. And the problem is we often need both. If you're gonna build a lift mechanism and you want it to be really, really fast so it can score the game pieces, but then at the end of the game, you want it to be extremely, have, have massive amounts of force and torque, uh, you can't. Not if you're gonna use the same motors. It's just not possible. There are ways around almost everything. If you have a, a dual gear system, a shifting gear system, you could you could have a situation where you shift gears. My experience is it's um it's often difficult for students to remember to shift gears because the game is stressful and chaotic and it's exciting and remembering anything is very problematic. So um, we tried to. We try to get motors to do one thing really well, but also at the same time, it's kind of a, it's kind of a lie because we often will try to make our mechanisms do as many things as we possibly can. So, motors. You need to remember to calculate in the inefficiency of the motors and then design for safety. We generally try to do double or four times as much force as we need because this is what's kind of nutters that most people don't realize. Um, spur gears. You're going to lose about 10% of your efficiency. Chain sprockets, 80%. A worm gear, 70%. I feel like that's even, I think it's worse than that. Uh, planetary gears, 80%. So the, the image that you see, it's a classic three sim motor, um, two stage reduction gearbox from VEX. And it has two spur gears for the reduction. And then this would oftentimes be connected to a sprocket system with chains uh, or belts. You're gonna get something very similar with chains and belts. Belts are gonna be a little bit more efficient, but still you're losing 35% of your power. So if you do the motor calculations, you're like, we're putting this much power, our motor is gonna be putting out this much power. That's great. You're not getting that. You're never getting that out of your motors because you just have a situation where um, there's too much inefficiency in the system. Also, this is a motor curve. If you've never seen a motor curve on this, someone on your team should know how to read a motor curve. The purple line is power, speed, current, and efficiency. Now, what you see up on the screen is you want to have max efficiency, but it is problematic because if you have your motors, your high power is coming at a place where it's, it's not very efficient. And this becomes problematic because you're gonna have a situation where you're just running through your battery. It's all about trade-offs. 
everything's all about trade-offs in engineering, this doubly so. You have to really ask yourself, what is the speed that we, we need? What is the rotation? What is the revolutions that we have to have for this mechanism to work properly? Uh, does that give us enough force? Do we have enough um, torque from this in order to get done what we need to do? And that can be difficult sometimes. You only have so many motors, you only have so much. I mean, obviously you can, something else that uh, may or may not be obvious. When you go through a gear reduction system, you, if you cut the speed in half, you double the force because of the force velocity ratio. So that's, that's just another thing that you have to think about. And it is always about the trade-offs. This uh, is still sim motors, most of us, are switching over or have already switched over to Falcon 500s, but still the general idea is the same. This is a nice chart to try to think about because the heavier your robot, the more motors you have, the more wheels you have, the faster it's going. Um, all of these are going to tax your system a little bit more. And what you see here is you don't want it to redline. It's going to be some problematic situations. Also, if you have six motors on your drivetrain and you floor it, you might end up losing connectivity because if you're not careful, it's gonna to pull too much. It's gonna to uh, draw too many amps and you're going to lose power to your radio and then it'll talk to your robot from your drive station and everything is worthless if you can't connect. So, what do you decide? Well, you picked up on the theme, the answer to everything in all of my presentations is there are lots of options and it depends. So where to start? This is what I like to say to everybody. Um, learn the options. That's why I started putting together this PowerPoint. That's why I started looking into this stuff. Uh, look online, talk to mentors, look at old videos, look at old teams, uh, some of the legacy teams that have been around forever. If you want to feel inadequate about your bots, then heavily recommend the Robo Wranglers, Team 148 out of Texas. So look at all the manipulators that exist. Then this is something we don't often focus on enough. Make sure you know your strategy for this game. What are the manipulators that will work for this game? But more specifically, what are the manipulators that will work for your strategy? And what do you need to do? Then, okay, what are you capable of? And this is always a, this is again, this is always like a little push and pull in a stretching situation. I always want my kids to be striving, kind of, I always want to push them to try something they haven't done before. But at the same time, you never want to force them to take on more than they can accomplish. So it's, it's always difficult. Just because you've never done it before doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Maybe this is the year to do that. So that's always something to consider. And then this is where you nail the bullseye. This is where your design is. So, uh, summary, look around, see what works, know your objective, stay within your capabilities. Um, these are my general two of us. I want to make sure I have some time for questions here. Uh, refine the design. The first design is always the worst by definition. Okay, that's not always true. We've We've, uh, we've redesigned and, and made something worse uh, on many occasions. Uh, poor craftsmanship, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. You can have the most amazing design, but if you build it badly or the electrical team doesn't wire it correctly, it's, it's worthless. Poor craftsmanship will ruin the best design ever. Lastly though, um, you need to have fun. We can't forget this is supposed to be enjoyable. Like if, it's, if, if your robotics team is, is stressful, okay, I get it. There's some stress, but at the same time, this is fun. It's not about, we're not building robots, we're building engineers. We have to always remember that, that this is about having fun and teaching uh, the next generation of engineers how to solve problems and deal with not enough resources. So we put googly eyes on our robot every year. And this year we got to put a mouth on it, which is just so much fun. I love the mouth on the robot. And we also, we will give the manipulator a comical name. If you have a giant hammer on your robot, that better be Thor's hammer. And you better call it Mjolnir. And I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. And someone just like was shocked about that, but have fun.
don't ever forget to have fun and enjoy what we're doing here. Um, lastly, I borrowed a lot of this from Bruce Whitfield, who borrowed it from Andy, who borrowed it from Greg Needle, and I don't know where these slides started, but that's where it came from. And the resources are here, and this PowerPoint will be, so I have, uh, did I do that? Okay. Yeah, that's my, my email address is up on screen, and yeah, and I think I will have this, this video will be posted on the um, Jumpstart website and the Jumpstart YouTube channel soon. Uh, questions? You can either type them in the comments or unmute your mic and fire away. Thanks, Luke. I like this smile face. I was going to ask, uh, Teresa, it says you're a rookie coach and you're with CHS. What's CHS? Chisholm High School. Oh, cool. Nice. I was just like, my brain was flipping through lots of different uh, schools around the place. Welcome. The best advice I ever got in my rookie year was um, success is a moving robot. And <laughs> we, I, I hung my head on that and I lived on that. And it was, it was, well, I'm still here. So, I mean, it was a lot of fun. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of support. There's a lot of support. Uh, don't worry about reaching out. Somebody like reach out to everybody. They will oftentimes be more helpful than you'd ever imagine. Cool. Thank you. Of course. When you're going through that initial, when your team goes through the initial design process and you're narrowing things down, how do you organize that thought process? I know sometimes we do the giant sticky notes but it all turns into a huge mess and it gets really chaotic. Yes, um, it is. That's an excellent question. Uh, what we usually do is we try to, well, one, we always focus on the strategy first and then we try to accomplish, like, okay, what are the designs out there? And I'll force, um, so I'll have my design team. They will do research and come up with, they have, we have to have at least three choices to choose from. Um, and once we have three choices, they, and the design team themselves will kind of narrow things down as much as possible. So we have a smaller sub team that's working on that. And then they will bring their three options to the team as a whole, and then we'll vote on it. And then usually we'll discuss, prototype, think about it a little bit more, try a few things out, do a little bit more research, try to kick the tires and figure out why this is actually a bad idea. <laughs> That's what we always try to try to look at. And then from those three, we will try to make a final decision from there. Um, it, I've found the best way because it does get a little crazy in the beginning, like you're saying. Uh, and there is the philosophy that there's no such thing as a bad idea. I think we all know that's not true though, uh, especially when you have a bunch of high schoolers with so much energy and off the wall ideas like, what if we built a nuclear reactor the size of a battery? Would that work? And I'm like, oh, for the love. That's, we're not doing that right now. Uh, so we found that having the design team narrowed down really helps. And focusing on the strategy also helps. All right. Thank you, Mark. And, and thanks for the great presentation. Um,